Hi everyone, I'm MK. I have been teaching for over six years and today I'd like to talk to you about information delivery. This is fantastic if you're homeschooling the last few weeks and you've drank yourself through several bottles of wine already. Uh, it's really good if you are in university and you do a lot of public speaking or there's a lot of transferable skills today if you're in business and you do a lot of presenting or selling to clients. Uh, before I begin, I just want to apologize for the background noise. I have two puppies uh, beside me here and they are in peak play mode, so I'm sorry if you can hear that. Um, before we begin, I have three questions I would like you to answer. Why are you watching this video? What do you hope to get from it? Number two, what do you think is the last method of delivery? And number three, what do you think these numbers symbolize? So please pause the video now, have a think about those questions, and I will give you some answers soon. Okay, so first I will explain the numbers. So these numbers are basically the likelihood you are of to retain information. So you can see some you retain very little information, and others you can retain a lot. So we're going to talk about the different styles of delivering information and how you can increase your retention of retention of information. So, first on our list is lecturing. As you can see, this is a very poor way to deliver information, only 5%, and yet it seems like the default way for humans to deliver information. It has no autonomy, it, there's only one source of information, it's not interactive, it's not engaging, uh, the person doesn't have a time to share their own ideas or opinions, and it's really not a good way to learn. Second on our list is reading. Reading is only 10%, but I wouldn't worry about that because we have lots of other reasons for reading. It's great for comprehension. It's great for exploring different feelings, emotions, knowledge. It's autonomous. The student chooses themselves. It's student-led, and it's very time management friendly. The student can do it whenever they want in their own time. So reading is really valuable, and it shouldn't necessarily be the only way that you deliver information, but it's definitely something to encourage, and it's less screen time at home. So next we're going to talk about audiovisual, which is how you are learning right now on a video. Um, to make our audiovisual number, to bump it up a little bit, I've given you a pre-exercise, which was three questions that I asked you to answer, and I'm giving you a post-video exercise. You can find the questions in the comments below. Most of them are true and false, so it should take very little time to answer them, but really will help you remember what you've learned today and actually put it into practice. So please try and do that if you can. Next, we're gonna move on to a really important part of learning, and this is where I like to start mostly in class, is with demonstrating. Demonstrating is you when you work through something you want the students to do step by step. It's really important when you're demonstrating to speak as little as possible. A lot of new teachers think their voice is the most important in class. That's actually not true. And so when you're demonstrating, try and cut your TTT. I'll give you an example of oh, TTT is teacher talk time. Try and cut your teacher talk time. I'll give you an example of really poor demonstrating. My niece and I went to a really great science fair in Galway one year and there was a lovely woman there. She was a lecturer, obviously very educated in science, and she was trying to guide my niece through steps of using a pipette. And she used very complicated language. She said, apply pressure to the pipette, insert it into the container, the cylinder, uh, allow the pressure out, pour the liquid into the next container. And after a few minutes of my niece being very confused about this, I give her very simple instructions, squeeze, down, let go, up, over, squeeze. So I use six words to explain the instructions of what she had to do. When you're demonstrating, it's very important to elicit. Eliciting is basically just asking questions. So why are we doing this step? What do you think the next step will be? What do you think will happen at the end? It's really useful when you're planning an activity or an experiment or even doing something at home like cooking or cleaning. Um, eliciting is also really valuable when you're trying to begin a topic. So for example, I want to talk about four animals today. 
cat, dog, bird, and fish. I could give all that information to the students from one source, or I could elicit. I could say, tell me some animals you know. The likelihood is they're going to tell me at least three of those four animals, and then three quarters of my information has come from another source. So this is a great way of cutting down your TTT, cutting down your talk time, engaging the students, making them feel involved in the topic, and definitely I advise it. Uh, eliciting is also great for when you're at home. It's for empathy, reasoning, working through things, understanding the world a bit better, critical thinking. So why am I doing this right now? What do you think the result is going to be? It could be anything that you're doing. It could be working on your computer from home, whatever it is. Um, it's great for uh, empathy skills. So if you're a bit upset with what your child is doing that day, you can say, how do you think I feel right now? When do you think I feel this way? Um, it works through a lot of emotive language. It's very good. I like to use it for discipline a lot. So instead of saying to my students, no, stop doing that, I like the no to come from them. So I say, should you be doing that right now? Why? So not only do they have to decide themselves that they shouldn't be doing it, but they have to reason why they shouldn't be doing it. Um, or what should you be doing right now? It gives them responsibility and it helps them understand that it's not just reward and punishment, that there's reasons behind expected behavior. Um, it's also really good for if you're in business and you want to add value to your product. So for example, today I want to add value to my video. So at the start I asked you, what do you think you're going to gain from this video? And at the end I'm going to ask you again, tell me three things you learned today. So I'm adding value to my product and the value isn't coming from my opinion about my product, it's coming from your opinion about my product. So listening is really important. Next we're going to move on to discussion. Discussion makes things so much more efficient in the classroom. It's also a, a really healthy guide to make sure that students are using their peers as valuable people in class. So, for example, when we do big book story time, every student's hand will go up after I turn the page. And they all want to have a turn of telling teacher what they think about that page. So instead of doing that, they're not allowed to ask me any questions or say anything, but every time I turn the page, they get 30 seconds to talk to the person beside them. This means that you are giving them another audience. So they're not just interacting with teacher, their own peers, other people beside them are just as important. They're just as good sources of information. They're just as good people to ask questions. In an adult environment, discussion is excellent as well. I uh, recently gave a um, conflict resolution training to my writers group. So uh, we talked a lot about, we elicited a lot, I got much of my information from them. And I also got them to discuss because I know that I don't know everything about conflict resolution. I know that there are a lot of ideas and opinions in that room that are valuable and that I would like to know. So I asked them to discuss after I had presented and then I ask them for feedback, tell me what's the most important thing you discussed. So again, it's engaging, it's got their critical thinking going, it's interactive, and also they're mixing with lots of other people in the room. Next is practice doing. Practice doing, you see it's about 75% retention. So this is definitely where you wanna stop the boat on the first day and keep doing the practice doing as much as you can. Uh, practice doing has to be done in steps and stages. The way I like to explain this one is, for example, if you are teaching the clock. So the first step would be to teach the long hand, which is the minutes. The second step would be to teach the short hand past. The third step would be to short hand two. And then you would give a production exercise. So the first production exercise would be to give them a clock with the time on it and ask them to write a sentence of what time it is. And then you'd give them a harder production, which be you'd give them a sentence with the time and then they have to draw it on the clock. So that they find that one more difficult than the first production. So you can see we have practice, 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 production, production. So this is how we work through practice doing. If they're not sure about practice doing, if there's a stage that they're not sure about, go back to demonstration or elicit. Um, 
finally, da -da -da -da, our last one. I don't know, have you guessed what it is? I'm sure some of you have. It is teaching others. Teaching others is very important. If they can explain the very basics of what they've learned, they probably need to review again. And I would definitely look at it in three or four days more time, maybe on a Friday. Um, if they're able to explain step by step to another person in your house or to another work colleague or whoever it is, that means that they fully understand this topic and you definitely can leave it now. They're far more likely to use the information and to keep using it if they are able to do this step because this step means confidence. So not only do I know it, I'm able to share this knowledge. Get someone else in your house to pretend that they don't understand and get your student to try and teach them. This is also a great way for siblings to bond, especially if one sibling is much older than the other or kid and grandparents can really get involved in this as well. And it means that the person who is the primary teacher for the week gets a little bit of a break as well while they go off and tell the other person in the house. Um, please let me know, did you enjoy this video? Please do the questions below because it will help me understand which bits I need to explain a bit more. And give me some feedback if you would like to. And thank you very much for watching my video. Take care. Sorry again about the noise. My dogs are insane. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>